who we have here from my far left, Dr. Mark Trombley. Uh, and then sitting next to him is Kim Sanderson, who is with the city of Edmonton. And he is a designer and an innovator and works to build better parks and playgrounds for our children. And so thank you for coming, Kim. And sitting next to Kim is Emilea Karhilu, who is with the... Uh, Al uh, sorry, the Alberta Native Friendship Center, and uh, she is working in urban diabetes initiatives with children, so thank you very much. And then we have Jamie Sanderson, or sorry, Jamie Sterling, <laughs> and Jamie Sterling is uh, the program coordinator with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Edmonton, so that's an interesting perspective. And then we have uh, Dr. Nancy Spencer Cavalier, and Nancy is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Physical Education here at the University of Alberta, and her uh, area of research is active, healthy children, and also has an interest and expertise in the area of adapted physical activity and children with disabilities. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Dr. Jeff Ball, who is the uh, um, director of the Center for, I always forget the name, the Center for Weight and Health Management at the Stollery Children's Center. And, and so has a, works a lot with children with obesity issues. So what I'll do is again, start from my far left. So just a few minutes. Um, if uh, we can ask each of the panelists to speak about this issue, what they think is the most important factor to address or to think about in terms of childhood obesity. And I'll ask, uh, Mark, if you can take the microphone there, and then we'll just pass it along as we go. And you can take it off the stand if that's easier. Oh, uh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to go ahead. Okay. All right. So I prepared a couple of notes here. So I just the, so um, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, very important discussion. I want, I want to just address the key factor that drives the work that I do, and that's with the for sport. Actually, I'm I'm not really a designer. I'm I'm I, I'm an advocate for children's play, sport, and recreation, and that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, is the thing that drives a lot of the work that I do. And Article 31, so just the, what does that Article 31 speak to? It's the right of every child to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to the age of the child. And further that it's um, government shall encourage the provision of appropriate and equal opportunities for cultural, artistic, recreation and leisure activities. Um, now, uh, Further to that, the international advocates have coined this term child-friendly cities or child-friendly communities as a way into this convention. It's a little less uh, threatening than this convention on the rights of the child. So in Edmonton, uh, we now have a child-friendly um, Edmonton office within the city. And I like this term, and in fact, I direct my efforts to creating a child recreation-friendly city. And I do this within four interrelated uh, uh, areas or domains or dimensions that try and deal with this issue we're talking to, uh, about today. And that's leadership, organization, programs, and environments. Bore, bored that from the Ontarians. Uh, and all the projects that I've tackled in this area uh, through the innovative work that we do um, has a connection to supporting healthy, active lifestyles. So with regard to that last dimension, which is environments, uh, we've just completed 10 years of progressive work on the design and construction of child-friendly play spaces and well, play environments. And through this work, we've expanded the view of the play space to incorporate zero to 18. So we're not just looking at these sites as uh, putting expensive manufactured equipment, but rather as a site to support healthy, active growth and development of children. So as a result, we now include skateboarding on these sites, we include mountain biking, we include nature. This nature deficit disorder thing is a very important uh, aspect of this. Uh, what else? We, we, uh, we, we create spaces that can be animated by leaders and even dimensions of city farms and adventure play. And best of all, all of these sites are accessible to everyone. Because we've mandated that every space meet a minimum requirement of accessibility. And that's according to the, to the new CSA uh, standard. So, um, uh, so we, we have summarized this work, and it's now available. 
I have a couple of copies, but I, I can <laughs> figure a way to get that to you. Just as a last point, um, uh, yeah, we want to share this work that we've done. So we held a national roundtable this uh, last February to uh, promote this work uh, across the country and to share these ideas and to see if we can develop some national strategies in this area. Thank you very much. I guess uh, I'll introduce myself and I'll give a bit of background. Um, so maybe you'll have some ideas of what you would like to ask me about. My name is Emilia Cariou. It's a little bit difficult, but hopefully you'll, you'll learn how to say it. Um, and do, I don't take, I, I know everyone always screws it up, so <laughs> I don't mind at all. Um, I also answered Emily. It's become pretty automatic. Um, anyways, I guess right now I, I'm the health coordinator for the Alberta Native Friendship Center. Uh, it's, uh, it's the provincial office for all the friendship centers in, in Alberta. We're located in Edmonton and I run a variety of programs. The largest program is the Aboriginal Urban Diabetes Initiative, which right now is focusing on prevention of type 2 diabetes in um, urban Aboriginal youth, where we used to focus on the adult population. We're moving into more prevention, trying to stop the problem before it, before it happens. Um, so I travel around the province to 20 different communities and try to bring programming into, that's one of our barriers we try to, we try to break down is the accessibility by bringing programming right into the community and making it accessible to, to all of these youth. Uh, in the past, I've also worked the Alberta Future Leaders, so I've worked on reserve. I actually worked in Swan River, it's near uh, Lesser Slave Lake, and that was with the Alberta Parks and Recreation Sport and I'll mess that one up too. Um, really great program. Um, and one of the things I like best about that program is they try to make recreation sustainable, um, accessible, and financially available to youth. So you go into a community and you try to actually create a recreation program that's going to maintain itself after you leave. Because you send in these recreation workers that aren't actually from the community, and uh, they set things up and kind of train the trainer teach community members how to take it over and maintain it. And I've seen a lot of success with that program, so I feel like you should look into that one as well. Um, I guess another thing I also focus on is just recreation in general, trying to bring back more recreation initiatives for um, within communities through our friendship centers. We're trying, right now we're, we have a charity run. I have some brochures at the back you can check out if you want to join us. But all the money from this is going to a trust fund for friendship centers so that we can start funding more recreation initiatives, um, such as teams want to join a basketball league, but they don't have uniforms or the registration fees. We'll fund that. Or they need to rent a gymnasium. So trying to break down some of those barriers. Um, I think I'll, I'll probably just pass this on. Um, please ask me questions. There's lots of things I'd love to talk about uh, related to child obesity and just health initiatives in general. Okay, so I am Jamie from the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, we operate nine clubs throughout Edmonton that are in high risk, low income communities. We try to provide, or we do provide, I didn't say we try, we do provide a very safe and supportive environment for our children and youth where they can increase their self-esteem, um, have opportunities to meet new people, uh, overcome their barriers, build positive relationships. Right now our key focus is actually on a project um, that we have for the next three years. It's called Healthy for Life Cool Moves. Our first year is in our actual clubs where we are promoting um, increase of knowledge and awareness, changing behaviors in our kids through nutrition, physical activity, and in a pos uh, positive social environment. And we do this through a wide variety of programming, um, activities and teachable moments where the kids are constantly having fun, giving us feedback, saying this is what we want to do, providing with them with opportunities they don't necessarily have. And in this, when they participate, we then reward them with Cool Moves points. And they are rewarded for making healthy choices in the areas of nutrition, physical activity, and learning. So that positive social environment. Um, through our initial funding that was from Alberta Healthy School Communities Wellness Fund along with programming that we've gotten from Capital Health, Canadian Diabetes Association and the Be Fit for Life Centre, we've already shown and we've only been within three of our clubs right now and with progressing throughout the rest of the three years 
that there is a very need for this within our, within our clubs, within the kids that we're serving. And we are setting the groundwork for making these kids having healthy choices and empowering them to be healthy. And we do that by recognizing their efforts through rewards, out trips and prizes that promote them to be more active. Um, we do f so, so much for them and we, we ask for a, a lot back and a lot of supports that we've gotten. So any questions you, that you have about this project, um, I'm willing to offer and as well as any, anything else, I guess. Um, my name is Nancy Spencer Cavalier, and as Tanya mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation. I'm just newly an assistant professor there, so this is my first Oprah moment of my life to be up here, <laughs> which is cool. Um, she also mentioned that I've been hired in the area of active, healthy children, but my real emphasis has been with children with disabilities. And I've taken the approach in my research that children are the experts on their own experiences, and so in all of my work, it's the emphasis has been from the perspective of the child. So my main interests have been in the area of inclusion. And there's many different definitions of inclusion, but the one that I like the best is sort of a blend of two different authors. One is Steinbeck and Steinbeck, who talk about inclusion as a sense of belonging, acceptance, and value. And the other is from Ben Gatnerier, who talked about integration as being able to be and allowed to be yourself. And what I like about those definitions is that they broaden them to all children. And so we don't always have to say everything specific because you have a disability. Um, the other thing about my work is I like to think of disability more along the World Health Organization definitions where we think of it as, yes, a personal situation, but interacting with our social environment to recognize all those things in the environment that contribute toward disability. So it's not just the person who has one. Um, most of my research to date has been with children with disability exploring for them what are legitimate and meaningful opportunities to take part in physical activity. Hi, I'm Jeff Ball and I'm, uh, well, first I'd like to say thanks very much for including, including me uh, in the panel. It's, uh, it's a nice variety of folks we have up here. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and um, I'm an obesity researcher and I'm fortunate that uh, the research I've done to date has kind of spanned some prevention and uh, a lot of treatment related work. So the smaller part of my job is related to um, a, a growing prevention project that we have with the First Nations community north of Edmonton. And uh, we're working with the community, building community capacity and connections and all this groundwork that goes into that sort of process, which for a, a clinical kind of type A person has been a bit of an adjustment, uh, but it's been a, a great learning experience because things happen at a very different pace in the community. So uh, my colleagues remind me often to just take it easy and things will happen. <laughs> Be patient. Uh, but that actually has been good because it's helped to inform the bigger part of my job, which relates to treatment. So... Um, the other part of my job is I'm the director of the Pediatric Center for Weight and Health, which is at the Stollery Children's Hospital, and it's part of Capital Health's WeightWise initiative. And we were really there from the beginning, uh, so it's been a couple, two and a half years, I guess, since WeightWise has been launched, and it's grown uh, exponentially. Uh, there's lots of services that I won't get into, but I'm happy to ask questions or answer questions people may have. But uh, I'm fortunate that we have a fairly big multidisciplinary team, some of whom are in the audience today and can answer these questions just uh, as well as I can. But um, we provide care for overweight children and adolescents and their families. So a lot of the focus we do is, while kids are the vehicle to get into our clinic, we really do work a lot with moms and dads. And uh, we're, we've got a number of different programs that we're testing out. Of. One of the unique features of our program is that all the families that come to us are actually enrolled as research volunteers. So getting back to the inspect, not just expect aspect that Mark had mentioned, uh, we're pretty meticulous in the information that we collect because we need to inform what we do from a health services delivery perspective. Uh, and that work has really led to another initiative which is just getting off the ground but it relates to obesity research in Canada and that's called ACORN. And ACORN is an acronym which stands for Addressing Childhood Obesity Through Research and Networking. And Mark and myself are on an interim steering committee that we've uh, just started and we'll be doing some work over the next uh, year or two getting things off the ground. But the idea here is to build capacity we know that there are probably 1.5 million overweight boys and girls in Canada, and in terms of health services delivery, it's woefully inadequate to deal with a lot of the issues that Mark had mentioned earlier today about metabolic syndrome, uh, not just medical issues, but mental health issues and social issues within families. So that's kind of a snapshot of what I do. 
Thanks very much. So as is really evident, it's a, an excellent panel with a lot of expertise from a multiple perspectives. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to come up to either one of the microphones. And again, you can ask a question of anyone or all of the panelists. And um, so as nobody is rushing up, I'm going to ask a question. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, you, you can formulate your questions while, uh, while we're asking this. So what I'd, what I'd like to know is it's come across quite clearly both in uh, the presentation this morning and I was talking with Kim and Jamie just as we were getting ready to start this, that it's the complexity of this issue is is huge and I don't think that there's any, there is no magic bullet. I think that's pretty obvious. So I'm just wondering if anybody wants to speak to, if you had to pick one thing to focus on that you were going to say, this is, if I have to put all my eggs in one basket, which wouldn't be a, a healthy thing to do, but uh, if you had to, what would you, what would you do? And, and I'll open it up to anybody who wants to jump in there and answer that. Nobody wants to commit. Oh, a brave, brave Kim. Well, that's that's a tough one. Um, like I mentioned, I've been involved in doing innovative projects for uh, about the past ten years, and uh, so we've we've got a lot of different angles that we've gone at. But the one that I keep coming back to, and that this is what the advocates internationally keep promoting, is this idea of adventure play and city farms. So this is our big thing right now. Is is uh, uh, creating these sites where young people can come in on a daily basis and be active. They can connect with nature, they can grow their food, they can uh, nurture it and uh, uh, pick it and cook it. And, and, uh, and there's a connection to nature on these sites. There is uh, democracy and community development on these kinds of sites. They're, there's, uh, they're all throughout Europe uh, with millions of user visits every year. We're just trying to reintroduce this into Canada. It was uh, with us uh, in the in the 70s, but um, they kind of died out. So we're trying, because they're, they're a tremendous response uh, in, in all the projects we've done. So if there's one thing that I would do is continue to focus in on this thing called city farm and adventure play. Great. I, I my view is if there was, if we were limited to doing one thing, I would suggest not bothering and invest in something else. Uh, the issue, because no one thing is going to solve the problem, and I don't think, if, if you even talk to the uh, smoking cessation people and said, can you tell us what was the one thing that really ca caused the drop uh, in smoking prevalence from 51% down to about 20 uh, across the last 40 years, they couldn't tell you. And it becomes unimportant. You attack from all sides, and and when you when you force uh, people to pick one thing, you disenfranchise nine out of ten people in the audience. So if I say, invest in physical education teachers, you're not very happy. It's not it's supporting your th stuff, and 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 it, it it's a disenfranchising, it's a disempowering process, and the issue. We know enough that the issue is big and complex and no one thing is going to work. And so I think the one thing is, is the hook that we let the government off with and, and we can't, you know, because they're going to, and Raj yesterday did a great job in, in Calgary, um, uh, one of the MLAs from Edmonton. Um, and um, we, we can't let the decision makers off the hook with that. There isn't one thing. They need to think about this bigger. They need to add extra zeros to the way that they're dealing with this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I have another 10 things lined up behind it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to speak to that? All right. I think the one thing that we would really push is putting or giving the kids that leadership component that they can take what they've learned and pass it on to people. So allowing them the, the opportunity that all this knowledge that they've gained, all this awareness, everything that people say, that now we have allowed them to make the choices to pass that along. So making sure they're the, the leaders within your program, the leader within your, your school, within your home, and it's not just people telling you, you need to do this, we're going to show you what you need, and it guides them to what they then potentially need really in their life without having you know, putting that finger at them, that you better do this, like they've been kind of told. So making sure that 
you know, they're teaching other kids. They're, they feel proud about what they've learned. They feel confident. And once you've gained that inner strength, it's really easy to pass it along and encourage other people to follow as well. I'd just like to add to that point, and I think it's a great point that you raise. Uh, oftentimes with interventions and with programs, it really is focused on the behaviors themselves. And oftentimes if we take more of an indirect approach to it, uh, you can have the same kind of impact and probably a greater impact. Um, some of you may be aware of Tom Robinson at Stanford in the States, and he's done interventions that he calls stealth interventions. And these interventions uh, indirectly have an impact on weight, or he thinks they have an impact. He thinks they can have an impact on weight, but the more proximal issue that gets people engaged in them is not weight at all, is not physical activity related at all. It's about social connectedness, it's about having fun, it's about doing all these other things that will then filter down to have an effect on weight at some point or at effect at behaviors at some point. So the, the approach we take may be, uh, I think that indirect aspect has something to it. Thank you very much. And we do have a question, Candy. Hi, I'm Candy McAlary, is it live? Can you hear me? I'm Candy McLeary from Mount Royal College. I'm also on the advisory board for the Alberta Centre for Active Living. I have a question for each of the panelists. Um, to respond to Mark's presentation, and Mark, I love your pres loved it the second time around. It was fabulous. I think there's so much information you shared with people. I'm just wondering from the perspectives of each of the panelists, what would be the nugget, sort of the piece of information that you'd like to take away that might inform things, how inform you to p possibly be doing things differently in their different modes. So, what would be the biggest uh, piece of information, or the most impactful information that you could take away from Mark's presentation? We'll start at this end. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> no pressure. Um, the biggest thing I, I think that. Uh, that comes away from that talk, and I've seen variations of that talk that Mark's given in the past, and each time there's, there's usually, or each time there has been different things that have come out of that. Um, but I think from a researcher's perspective, I, I really like the idea of, or I, I believe in the idea of inspect, not expect. Uh, we do that clinically uh, within our program. We know from the 20 or so programs across the country, most places don't do that, and a lot of the data that's collected is retrospective, and it's often very messy and, and uh, I think if we're talking about programs, whether they're prevention programs or treatment programs or what have you, we need to be very mindful of the information that we're collecting, how we collect it, what infrastructure we need to make sure that the information is collected in the best way possible. Because oftentimes all this investment is put up front where you're going to develop the program and you get all these people involved and you've got the program deliverers and all these things, but then at the end the data aren't collected in a, in a systematic or in, a, in, in the best possible way. And that is an injustice to the type of program. Or that's a, it's a severe drawback to the programs that we're trying to evaluate and then not just evaluate but then disseminate and have other people take up. So that's always the biggest, uh, the biggest thing for me. And I'll tie my answer specifically to disability since that's my area, but the idea um, that disability isn't the reason. Um, it, absolutely there are more risk factors um, that go alongside with disability, risk of inactivity, you have lower accessibility, secondary conditions as a result, but disability doesn't have to mean inactivity. They don't really actually go hand in hand, but quite often that's an assumption. And then also this idea of empowering, um, not just people with disabilities, but we all have social roles to, and relationships towards each other and responsibilities towards each other, whether it's disability related or not. So I think those aspects of empowerment and relationships and social responsibility are all key elements to this issue. Um, I'm definitely going back and reviewing all the surveys and evaluation and measurement tools that we use because <laughs> you can collect stats galore and they mean nothing in the end if it's not relevant or even what you're looking for. So that's for sure as well as the idea about the barriers that people face is not necessarily um, what impacts their choices I guess is what I'm going at. Like it doesn't matter if they're from low income have a disability or that kind of thing, they still are allowed to make those choices. I think, uh, well, something that I actually, I do in my own work, but I'm going to take away from, from the presentation as well as just the idea of empowerment, um, especially when you're talking about, about youth. Uh, I think one of the biggest reasons that a lot of youth won't take that step to involve themselves in some sort of recreation is 
they don't feel they have the power to do so or there's something missing and I really try to work on that empowerment through my work. Um, whether that means giving them choices, more choices is going to give them more power. Um, like we heard this morning in, uh, um, I guess, Honorable Cindy Addy, uh, her speech about her, some of her sons don't like competitive sports. So trying to give kids, don't al always offer soccer and basketball. You know, maybe bring in some skateboarding. You know, the alternative sports, extreme sports, bring, take them to climbing walls, um, running and cycling. Uh, just, and, try and, and same with playgrounds, uh, just trying to incorporate more play. There doesn't have to be, you know, an, a, a win or lose situation. Um, I'm trying to think, I had something else on my mind related to that empowerment. Um, if I think of it, I'll, I'll come back to it. Okay. Well, in, in innovation, you, you become a promoter. So the statistics, they always pick the top ones or the lowest ones to, to sell the, the case. So uh, anyway, the closer they are, I suppose, the, the better. But uh, the, the one thing that I uh, keyed in on was just limiting the screen time. You mentioned the screen invasion. These are kind of words that now are coming into our lexicon, but limiting screen time. It used to be television time. So um, uh, the one thing that I, I've found working with the Germans is they actually go into cyberspace with the kids. And, and learn uh, and, and explore with them. They said, you know, we, we keep thinking that as a bad thing from the physical activity groups, uh, our promo uh, supporters. Uh, and hearing your discussion on that, I, I made me more convinced that we have to go into cyberspace, work with the kids in cyberspace. And then they've got a thing in Germany where they talk about bits and bytes. Phys I think it's physical bits and computer bytes. So we have to help the kids connect back to the physical space, the physical bits. There's, they have some, some sort of way to talk about that. So I'm more convinced now that we have to do that. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Mark? No, we're good. Okay, we do have a question over here. My name's Taya Prull. I'm the Community Liaison Coordinator at the Pediatric Centre for Weight and Health at the Stollery. I work with Jeff. Um, in conversations like these, um, we talk a lot about um, the impact of behaviours on, on children's lifespan, their health. And um, what I, I was thinking a little bit about while I was sitting is, is a question I have that's maybe a little bit bigger and scarier than just um, lifespan health. And so I guess this question might be um, perhaps directed to um, Emilia, uh, Jamie and Jeff. And the question is, the children and youth um, today facing these issues, um, they're the parents of tomorrow. So in your programming or thinking, what, what kind of um, ways are you thinking about how we can address um, children's parenting skills for when they do become parents and they face these issues with their kids? Will they be equipped? Good question. Do you, do you want to start, Emily? Um, I think when I work with kids, I take a, I take a lifestyle approach. Um, I try to teach them how to work recreation and healthy eating into their own lives. I try to teach them about um, when they go out, you know, if they go out to a restaurant, how to make those healthy choices, what to look for, and other ways to incorporate recreation into their daily lives. And I guess uh, I try to, I just hope that um, these things are, are beliefs that, and values that they'll adopt and carry on. Uh, we do a lot, you know, we do a kind of multi-year programming with these youth, trying to, I guess, uh, bring the programming to them a little more often so that it becomes more of a lifestyle for them. I think if they're exposed to it a, a bit more that maybe they'll, they'll start to take it on. Um, I just wanted to comment one thing that I did remember that I wanted to answer just before about that empowerment and this is, um, I guess it's probably important to um, say with this question, is when I work with Aboriginal youth, one of the key factors if you go into any presentation on type 2 diabetes uh, is they're going to say being Aboriginal is a risk factor of developing type 2 diabetes and that's one thing I've never ever told children because I think it's, it's self-defeating. 
you know, they're not gonna, you know, they start to believe, well, I'm Aboriginal and there's nothing I can really do. I'm gonna get type 2 diabetes. I'm already at risk. That's something I don't, I don't tell them um, so that they, they don't, they have a bit more power about making those healthier choices. They don't feel like they've already, um, you know, the, it's already a defeated sort of purpose. Most of the kids we are, are seeing right now already have a lot of parenting skills because they're the ones watching their, their younger siblings. So really, it's just teaching them life skills, you know, learning to clean up after yourself, helping with the chores, doing the dishes, like just teaching them the basics of that and then providing them with guidance and education and, you know, knowing that if they are at home with their kids, we do have a program that's called Home Alone Latchkey where they're teaching we're teaching them about, you know, safety of being at home. So a lot of these kids are a lot older than they are, which is unfair because they should be kids in that sense. But they, I think a lot of them have the skills in place that we are just trying to plant that seed and, and allowing them to make those right choices as they continue on in their life. The philosophical approach that we take from a health services delivery perspective is to really work with moms and dads. And I think we all are pretty firm believers of the role models or the importance of parents being good role models for their kids. So just as one example, uh, we have a program for uh, overweight boys and girls are referred to us. Kids who are between 8 and 12 actually don't come for any intervention. We actually have mums and dads come for uh, a program that we've called PAC, which stands for Parents as Agents of Change. And we've been piloting this program for the past year and a half, and we start a formal clinical trial in the fall, but, uh, and we have some mental health professionals who are working with us and we use cognitive behavioral therapy and some specific modalities to try to emphasize those points but it really does require parents to be engaged they can't be passive uh, sitting there with their butts in their seats and not engaged on a week-to-week -week basis uh, and there are lots of challenges with that dropout is an ongoing issue because issues of readiness and motivation come into this as well so uh, we're trying to fine-tune and try to do the best we can uh, to, to increase uh, or to decrease attrition, but uh, when families are ready and when, mom, when moms and dads are ready to do something about it, we've got something for them and we've got um, some nice success stories of families who have been really engaged and moms and dads really get that message. But um, the sad thing that we see oftentimes is we see kids or teens who are ready and mom and dad are not ready. And that's a very, very challenging thing for us to deal with professionally because we think we've got something that's great, but the family doesn't have the resources or the capacity or the what have you to do it. So uh, that'll still be an ongoing thing for us probably as long as we're around is to work with moms and dads and help them be the best role models they can be. Um, since children with disabilities become parents too, um, I think that really when we talk about parenting, we're really talking about modeling and role models and becoming good role models for your own children. And so having opportunities at a young age to be educated, to be informed, um, to do things that that make you value yourself are all the kinds of things that contribute to becoming a good parent as well. So I think that's also very relevant um, for children with disabilities to think of them as future parents and quite often we don't think of them that way. Thank you. We have several questions. We'll start here and then uh, go over there. Thank you. Um, my name is Catherine Tamanen. I'm a PhD student at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation. Um, and my question is for the entire panel, so hopefully each of you can speak to this. And we all know that obesity in childhood is an issue, and we're also concerned with measurement. But my question to each of you is how do you, as researchers or as program developers or decision makers or just as individuals, how do you measure success? How do we know when we've achieved success in this area? Another good question. Who wants to leap in there? And... Okay, we'll start with Mike. I think I think that's a it's a great question, um, and I think we've made mistakes um, in in the past, and probably have thrown out some good program intervention ideas because we've been measuring the wrong thing, or because we haven't been intervening long enough. And so, so you need to understand. Uh, how the behavior change process works. And so there are proximal and distal indicators that, uh, that we're interested in. And quite often, we immediately jump to the distal indicator. And so we intervene, whatever, in, in, in a school 
for one term, three months, um, and we expect to see changes in BMI compared to a control school or something like that, which is a ridiculous assertion uh, and um, a ridiculous expectation of the particular program. One, because it's too short, but two, because quite often that's not the indicator uh, of the intervention. The intervention may have been a physical activity program, and so it should be changes in physical activity level that we're measuring, not BMIs. We sometimes gravitate to the BMI because it's easier than do a good, doing a good physical activity or if similarly with healthy eating indicators and so on. So, so I think it's really important to, you know, to, to do your logic model and, and, and make sure that, that you understand the, the, the proximal indicators, uh, even formative indicators that might precede that um, and that the distal things, you know, is this going to change the comorbidities associated with, with uh, obesity? Well, you know, that, that's way downstream, and, and we're, we're too impatient. And I don't know if the fault is at the level of the researcher or the funder that typically will give you money for your project, done in four months, clean it up, fits within the fiscal year, and, and everything is good, so um, for what that's worth. Well, it, it's difficult because quite often you don't have all of the uh, different dimensions to a project line up. You don't... You, you, you get the policy that said, well, this is where we want to go and, and this is how we want to do it. Then you run the, 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 the program. And, and then are we meeting all of the different dimensions to this project? So then we say, well, okay, well, we want to actually do the study while we're doing the project and we have to find people who have the experience and expertise to do that. And that's a huge struggle. I mean, I've been over to the university. Some of you have seen me. You know, okay, I need you in here. You know, I say, well, you know, you really haven't set the program or the question quite right, or you know, we don't really have the researchers that like that area, or it goes on like that. So it's a really difficult challenge for us. And then, of course, when we do the project and we go for further funding and that, and folks say, well, what are your indicators? It's it's quite often quite difficult. Uh, with respect to my program, I think our our indication of success is mostly based on uh, positive participation levels. So uh, I know last year I was able to get out to 20 community, communities across Alberta and I was able to uh, do workshops and day camps with uh, almost 400 youth and I'm just one person. So I think, you know, based on just one program and one person, uh, it, was, it was a really good success and but that's still something that we're working on building more on. But I think that's our just positive participation in the programs is our, our biggest uh, measurement of success. Um, every program that we run, we pre-survey our participants to find out what their base knowledge is of whatever activity we're trying to do. So for instance, our, our Kumu's project, we've surveyed all of the kids when we've gone into the club as well as the staff to see what their base knowledge is just from questions of what are the four food groups. And then after we do our activities and we do our programs and we have our fun, um, in a course of either six weeks, it could be a matter of one week, we survey and, and ask the same kids, the same staff, the same questions, and then we see if we've, if hopefully have an increase, we've shown a positive change within their knowledge. And we are constantly doing that all the time and then we reevaluate and a lot of the stuff that we find are challenges or maybe failures we turn them into successes because it's always learning the kids are always changing and through all these surveys and the feedback that we get from the kids that's how we just continue to develop the program based on what they want um, I guess if the ultimate success is we're all jobless because <laughs> there's no point in talking about this anymore um, but I'll go more philosophical with my answer and sort of build on this idea of failure that for me it's about not being afraid to fail and being creative and innovative with the different kinds of approaches, looking at how that arrow can go both ways, how we can do things differently than we've done it in the past and not being afraid you know, to go after things in, a, in an entirely different way. And if they don't work, we still learn stuff from there. I think it depends on the audience. So uh, from my perspective, a health region might have a specific parameter or parameters they're interested in. Wait times, attrition, uh, we do service logs, so that's another way for us to measure our clinical activity. So if those things are, are acceptable to the powers that be, then that's success from a program perspective. 
uh, from an intervention perspective, from our team's perspective, I, I'll try to speak for the folks that, uh, that I work with. I think if we can, can demonstrate improved lifestyle behaviors, improved metabolic risk, improved mental health status, those sorts of things often are nice things for us to see and we define that as success. Uh, from a family's perspective though, I think it can be quite different. Um, we're just in the process of writing up a case study of one family um, and it was a very interesting family because socially very complicated. Uh, uh, BMI and BMI percentile remained the same over the course of a four month intervention. But family communication, family cohesion, family functioning, all these things, we also measure those aspects, uh, improved. Uh, and then a lot of the soft things, that families feel like they communicate better and they're more on top of things. And there's just this energy that's there that uh, was maybe other things were getting in the way of that. And that's something that you could potentially measure through a qualitative study. Um, but I would argue that all of those things can be your measures of success. So my uh, approach is often to try to triangulate and look at lots of different measures of success. But that takes time, it takes infrastructure, it takes expertise, it takes collaborations, um, and it's not uh, an easy process. Thanks very much. So again, the complexity comes out. So uh, we have another question over here. Thanks. Um, my name is Catherine Hagedorn. I'm the research coordinator um, with Jeff and Dr. Claire LeBlanc in the Department of Pediatrics here at the U of A. And I was struck by the variety of comments, but in particular the need to take a multi-pronged approach and also the fact that mostly we're preaching to the converted here in, in this particular audience. And so I wanted to inquire of the panel, within your own daily sphere of influence, how much engagement and buy-in do you encounter um, from the community, from those providers that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of industries, in terms of restaurants, in terms of um, all of those people and, and venues that are critical to your being able to do your job, but who are maybe not um, looking at it through an advocacy or a, a prevention lens? That's an excellent question. <laughs> and would anybody like to leap in and answer that one? Um, many of the organizations I work with are not for profit and they've already bought in, but a lot of them are really, really struggling. And where they're trying to garner support is through business, um, people who will donate money and who will buy into the cause. But the unfortunate part about that is you don't really want people to think of this as a cause. You want them to think of this as, you know, their responsibility to your neighbor kind of thing. And so I think sort of playing the pity card, the cause card in the past has generated some support from outside community and buy-in. But now the approach has almost been, how can this benefit you, right? Instead of, like, the, the question shouldn't be, what can I get from this, right? It should be, you know, what can I give? And I think that that's a real shift mentally that we need to start seeing for all of these issues that seem to be emerging from our own maybe lack of self-worth or, you know, lack of valuing things that are not material. So it, it's a hard call to get people to buy into that. I know uh, I work for a nonprofit and I send out hundreds and hundreds of letters and proposals every year. Um, that is one thing that a lot of businesses look for uh, and they'll actually state it, what, are, what will you give us if we give you, you know, this $1,000 for your camps or, you know, this money to travel. They're always asking what will you give them back. In my letters uh, that I send, I always try to make it a community involvement. I tell them we try to look for partnerships, and partnerships are what's going to make these programs stick. And it's those community businesses, uh, the local grocery stores, the local sports stores that are going to help, um, I guess, create the environment that makes that it, that's going to make these um, these foods, these um, I guess, recreation supplies more accessible for youth. I try to send kids away from all of our camps with something that's going to help them stay physically active. And uh, I guess that's something I always look for, you know, in my donation letters. But it's, I have to say, it, it is, uh, you know, based a lot on what will you give us back. And I, I would like to see a shift to, you know, more of a community spirit and a supportive environment. Well, I, I, for me, I, I, I go in, I get these innovation 
projects ready to go, and I think, well, it's the greatest thing since sliced cheese. And then you, you go, and, and, and all of a sudden, you get all of this pushback. And I, I've discovered that, really, it, children need advocates. And it's not simple to simply to say, well, children need to be, be physically active. Well, that's great, but guess what? I got another 30 things I got pot for us. It's, we've got potholes over here. We've got all of these issues that keep cropping up, and you're one of the many. And unfortunately, we have to spend a lot of time advocating for children, and we need to do a, a heck of a job on that to, to get this issue onto the main agenda. There's a lot of work yet to do on that. Thank you. Okay, we have time just for a couple more questions, so we'll go here, and then uh, one more over there, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Hi, Tanya. Good morning. I'm uh, Kelly Mermitz with Participation, and uh, thank you. This is an outstanding morning in your AWOW panel. Um, I believe that one of the reasons that Participation was revitalized is because, in fact, we do have a crisis as it relates to childhood obesity. Uh, but it's interesting, when we're out there speaking with the public, we're reluctant to talk, particularly when we're talking about children and youth, about weight. And so I was wondering if, one, you share that sensitivity about talking about weight, and then two, how do you address childhood obesity without talking about weight? Another very good question. Does anybody have anything? Um, I think it, this is a health issue, right? Weight is one of those outcomes, but if you think about your health, your physical health, your social health, your mental health, I mean, that's, that's what people can you know, hang on to because that's a really positive thing because we don't want things like weight to be the key thing because then we're talking about body image, which we know it, it can also become a major issue for a lot of people. So I think framing it in the positive as being your health and your well-being, I think those are the kinds of words that you use with children and that you use with adults, actually, if you want them to jump on too because body image is for the short term. Health is for the long term. The prevention program I talked about with our First Nations community outside of Edmonton, uh, although we had presented it to the funders as this is an obesity prevention type initiative, the community said, this is a child health project. So the community really spoke to us, and that's what the project has become because, again, the community has to own it if there's any sort of long-term uh, dissemination and implementation, and that's been, we've been responsive to that. But from a health services perspective, uh, within our clinic, we typically don't use the word obese. Um, if there's one word that turns off moms and dads right away, that's probably it. Uh, they know why they're there. They know their kid more or less is heavy. Uh, so we tend to use the term overweight and talk about it in an objective way. Uh, we did a qualitative study about a year and a half ago, and we, wanted to we interviewed families before they came to our clinic. And this, these are families who are on our wait list. And we wanted to get an idea of what they wanted from the service. And we also wanted to know what their previous experiences have been working with health professionals. And overwhelmingly, negative experiences with physicians, nurses, dietitians, and the way in which weight has been approached. So I think there's a lot we can do regarding bias, regarding sensitivity training, regarding awareness, and how to bring it up in an objective, um, sensitive manner to families. Because at the end, you want to engage families to be more healthy, to be more physically active, and to be uh, eating healthfully. But if you're starting the discussion with your child is obese and your finger is wagging and you've got this body language that you might not even say those words, but the body language is saying it for you. All of those things can set the tone and negative right off the bat. So um, that'd be my perspective on that. I was just going to add that while I don't like to use the word obese, um, I tend to use the word overweight a lot as well. I found that it's... Uh, children aren't actually all that sensitive to the word fat. It comes more from the parents. Um, when I'm working with kids, you know, they'll just kind of shout it out, even if they themselves are overweight. But it's not in a, I guess, not in a negative term. They're not, it's not like they're downing themselves. They just understand that that's where they are. I think that come, some of that, like the negative connotations with that related to body image come a bit later on. So I think we can get over that while they're still um, children and try to eliminate those negative, um, I guess just eliminate those negative connotations, we might, um, I guess, alleviate some of that sensitivity to the word later on. And I'm just going to add one thing. The word that we just never seem to talk about is fun. <coughs> like, why does physical activity have to be awful exercise that we have to get you to do this many times a day and so we can measure it and calculate and whatever? But 
kids should be having fun <laughs> and playing and enjoying that. And, and, you know, yes, the video games and things like that, that has that component of fun to it. But I'm not sure when being outside lost the fun factor. And, and the less you have to think about something, the better. So if it's just because it's fun and it's not because, you know, it's going to make me skinny, that's much better. And Ke Kelly asked about weight in, in particular, which is a, it's a dynamic issue through childhood and so it, it's a problem. And if you get parents fixating on weight when kids are growing, weight is supposed to increase. It's a good thing. And so in childhood in particular, one tries to focus on an individual level on, on promoting the healthy living behaviors. Um, and so weight loss in childhood is, is not a typical uh, approach. You want weight maintenance while the child continues to grow and, and, and those sorts of things. So, so it, it's, it's a dicey issue, but it really, and, and to speak um, uh, to, to Jeff's comments earlier, it depends on your audience. Ontario uh, government, just in its provincial budget um, six weeks, two months ago, uh, dedicated 10 million per year ongoing specifically for the prevention of childhood obesity. New money. Um, and there was a strategic discussion shortly thereafter about, so what are we going to do with that? How are we, how are we going to use it? And um, the, the group, you know, is speaking about healthy living behaviors. This is what we need to do. We need to increase uh, physical activity and, and, and improve eating behaviors and so on. And, and it wa many of the people wanted it framed that way. And the, the government folks are saying, listen, <laughs> this isn't going to fly at cabinet. The premier needs, you know, this is to be a childhood obesity intervention. Um, and, and so at that audience, it has to be childhood obesity that needs to be discussed. But I'll also speak a little bit against most of the panelists in that if, if we sugarcoat uh, the issue too much, we're just precipitating this disconnect between perception and reality, which many, many parents have, and we're experiencing this in the Canadian Health Measures Survey, when the information goes out that your BMI puts you in the obese category, and it's like, oh my goodness, that can't be, no, we're, it's not us, and, 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 and it sort of challenges the denial. So it's sort of finding the right balance and, and understanding the cues that will work for some, some individuals. The terminology, whether obesity is the term or overweight is the term, somehow getting across that, you know, you are part of that group that's at increased risk. And, 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 uh, and educating people about the healthy living behaviors that will, will help to overcome that. Great, thank you. So we'll have one last question. My name is Lisa McLaughlin and I'm a school health facilitator with the Apple Schools Project. And so we're working with mostly elementary kids, their families and schools to basically affect um, physical activity and eating behaviors. And I think most, more importantly though, um, part of the work that needs to be done in our project, but just in general as well, is really affecting um, cult the culture surrounding health and, and surrounding healthy eating and physical activity and value systems. Um, I think we're lucky we're a group of people who pretty much intrinsically value our health. And even I think for um, us, even though health as, um, I can't remember your name, said it's a kind of a longer term outcome. We're very aware of that. And in the day to day act activities that we engage in, we are always thinking about the long term outcome of the things that we do today. But I think that's not necessarily true for everybody. And I'm wondering if you have any insight into, um, you know, things that you've done, messages that you've used with children and with their parents as, as well to help change that value system and um, help make health outcomes more relevant today and to um, affect, affect that and to um, have them try and make decisions where health is a value outcome now rather than it being something that's dealt with a, in a reactive basis, you know, 10 years or 20 years down the road when suddenly, you know, you're developing type 2 diabetes and those other chronic illnesses. So I'm just hoping maybe somebody has some, I don't know, insight into things that we can be saying and addressing today. If there are any cognitive psychologists in the room, they can probably answer this question a lot better than I ever could pretend to. Uh, but in working with colleagues uh, who have that perspective, uh, the values and the beliefs that one has are formed fairly early in life and are often difficult or difficult to change. Um, so I think what Mark's example showed with the one slide with the arrow that starts off fairly flat and then progressively gets steeper is we really are talking about a change that's got to happen over a long period of time. Uh, if we're talking about a cultural shift, this is one of those things that we re would really need to be patient at and 
all of us in the room here are active, healthy role models, and we can be part of that cultural shift and how we communicate that and live that and, and program that uh, is a big part of that. But I would argue for a lot of the families that we see, we can't uh, change their moral values or the things that they intrinsically value, uh, but we can be healthy, active role models for them. We can give them nuggets of information over a fairly short period of their life that maybe plant seeds, and then over time those things cultivate and get passed on through their kids. But um, I appreciate it's a frustrating thing to deal with because you you want, you, you, there are those, these instances, our team can speak to this, there are instances where you just, you want to shake families. You think, why is this so difficult? Why are we, we're here at the same point now where we were two years ago when you first came in. Why haven't you been able to get there? What am I doing wrong? And it's a lot of this sort of stuff. But I think in a lot of instances we need to be a little bit more relaxed with that and understand everyone comes at it from a different place and at a different time. And if, but if we can plant seeds along the way that help to cultivate that cultural change, then that's a great accomplishment that we can all be, uh, be satisfied with. I think um, that, that the type of people that Jeff sees uh, at his center and that we see at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario are, are, the, are the really tough nuggets, the, the ones that are very difficult to shift. On a population level, if that's what you're speaking, I think the current um, uh, campaign that uh, Participation has is doing exactly what you're talking about, is trying to create an awareness of this sort of accelerated aging you know, that, we, that we're imposing upon our kids um, and uh, early uh, assessment results, and hopefully they'll be able to be uh, disseminated widely in the not too distant future, um, are showing that indeed it's achieving just that. So on a population level, not, not the, the, the ends of, of the tail that are most difficult to move, but it's resonating with people that they're understanding, you know, and, and sort of stepping back and saying, whoa, yeah, th you know, th there is some long-term consequence, you know, they're, they're not just chubby kids that are going to grow out of this and so on, and, and I think that speaks to the success of that, uh, that campaign. I don't know if this is a direct answer to that question, but I know um, in my own approach I use culture as a tool. Um, I try to work with the cultural values that are, may have already been instilled in, the, in children, so a lot of, most of the youth I work with already know what the medicine wheel is, the sacred circle, and if none of you know what that is, it, it's, uh, it, it incorporates mind, body, heart, and spirit. So I talk about taking a holistic approach to health, how it's not only good for, you know, your body, you know, lose weight, right? Um, and, you know, the healthy eating part for your body. But I talk about, you know, the social aspects, getting outside, playing with your friends, being with your family, um, I also talk about, you know, getting more sleep, you know, reduce your stress level. I think I'm losing volume here. Um, and trying, and you know, in your spirit. So spirit has to do with interconnectedness and that kind of goes with um, getting closer to nature, um, getting closer and just kind of getting closer with yourself, respecting your body, respecting your mind. Um, so I try to work with those cultural values rather than trying to change them try to see that they already, they actually already have those values. They just haven't looked at them the right way. I guess our right way, right? Thank you. Well, uh, speaking of culture, I think it's some of the theoretical frameworks that we're using. Jeff, you talked about cognitive psychology. So in our city farm, we actually are, are employing cultural psychology as, a, as our framework for viewing development. And we think that that's going to uh, gain us some benefits of that, but I don't want to go into the detail on that now, but I think we need new frameworks. We need new ways to, to, to view uh, development on these issues. And, and uh, so we're exploring on those levels. So just a short one. I think it's C.W. Mills that said, if you waited for everybody to get on board, you'd be waiting forever. But if an individual steps up, they can make a difference immediately. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't work on the big population levels, but I think that's the strength that we have in this room is that each individual is invested, and I think that you can't underestimate the impact that you as an individual can have on a number of people. Thank you, a very positive note to end on. So I'd just like to wrap it up there and uh, thank uh, all our panelists for their unique perspectives that I think uh, added a lot to the discussion. And, uh, and also thank you for all the excellent questions that came from the audience that really covered a, a breadth of topics and, uh, and again, made for a really good forum. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.